So the first thing to look at is when we transmit, we want to transmit some data between two devices, look at the very basics in terms of the physics of how do we transmit some information uh, between two devices. Well, we use some form of signals, some physical signals, and that's what this topic is going to mainly look at, the, the types of signals, the issues with the designing communication signals that can be sent between two devices. First, some terminology. Think of, in the simplest case, we have two devices connected via some link. We transmit data from one device to another. The source device is called the transmitter. It transmits the data. The receiver device receives the data. And in between the transmitter and receiver is the medium. What is actually sent between tra transmitter and receiver? Some signals which are in the form of electromagnetic waves. So in basic physics we have some wave, fo wave form carrying energy and they are our signals. And these, these signals must carry some information, for example bits, zeros and ones. So between transmitter and receiver is a medium. Well, we can classify this medium into two types, guided and unguided. A guided medium is when the signals is guided by some, uh, some material. The example is wired, uh, wired mediums, wires, cables. So you have a copper wire inside a LAN cable. And again, I don't have the LAN cable, but a copper wire inside a LAN cable with some plastic coating around that copper wire. If we transmit electricity across that copper wire, an electrical signal, then that signal is maintained along the copper wire and does not disperse or does not disperse much. You can think that signal as some waveform is guided along the copper wire. Similar if we have optical fibre, our signal is light. With optical fibre we have glass or plastic fibres and we send light into that fibre and it bounces over both sides and traverses through the optical fibre. The, the light, the signal, is contained within the optical fibre. It doesn't disperse, or not much at least. So that's a guided medium in that the signal is guided along a particular material. So wires and cables, twisted pair, uh, copper cables, coaxial cable, optical fibre. We'll talk about some of these technologies in the next topic on transmission media. Unguided is essentially wireless communications, where we transmit some signal and transmit it across the air, maybe through water or a vacuum in theory, and those signals may disperse in multiple directions. They are not guided by a particular material, by some cable or, or some wire. So when my laptop is using Wi-Fi, wireless LAN, it sends a signal to the access point up on the wall. And you can think the energy, there's an antenna built into the laptop, the energy is transmitted out of the laptop, some signal, and it disperses in fact in multiple directions. If we could see that signal, we would see some energy is travelling as a waveform to the access point, but also the signal is being transmitted in that direction, up, down, and essentially all around. So the signal is not guided inside a particular medium, it's unguided in this case. So essentially wired versus wireless, guided or unguided communication mediums. So this is the, the link between transmitter and receiver. And we're just classifying and introducing some terminology. This link that we set up between transmitter and receiver, we can configure it in two different ways. It can be a point-to-point -point link where we have one medium, one transmitter and one receiver, so just two devices sharing that medium, or a multi-point link 
where we have more than two devices, multiple devices sharing the medium. So commonly we will see point-to-point -point links. I connect a cable from my laptop to this PC, two devices sharing that link, sharing that medium. But we also see cases of multi-point communications where one device transmits and multiple devices may receive. And therefore we have multiple devices sharing that medium. And depending upon what we want to ch achieve in our communications, we may choose one or the other. They have advantages and disadvantages. In either case, when we have a communications medium, a link, the direction of communications may be either simplex, half duplex or full duplex. Simplex communications is that the medium transmits signals in one direction only. The, the communication system just transmits in one direction, from A to B. An example, television. With TV, there's a TV station that transmits some signal, and your TV at home has an antenna, maybe, that receives the signal. Your TV does not send anything back to the TV station. So that's a simplex communication system. The, the data is all traveling in one direction. Full duplex, at the other end point, is that we use the medium to transmit in both directions and at the same time. That is, we can transmit from A to B, and at the same time, using that medium, we can be transmitting data from B to A. So both directions at the same time. And in the middle, half duplex. Both directions, but only one at a time. So we have a link. A can transmit to B. B can transmit to A. But they cannot transmit at the same time. It's either one or the other. One direction or the other. So the direction, the different technologies and systems may be either simplex, half duplex, or full duplex. This lecture, when I'm talking to you, are we using a guided or unguided medium? Imagine the microphone is off. Are we using a guided or unguided medium? Unguided. The medium is air in this case. If the microphone's off, I'm talking and the audio signal is in fact going in all directions. It's not going across a cable. It's going in all directions and those within range will receive and hear it. Point to point or multi-point, this lecture. Hands up for point to point. Let's see who's following. Hands up for multi-point. Hands up if you don't know. Hands down if you don't know. <laughs> that confused him. <laughs> okay. It's multi-point. That is, you think of when I talk, there are multiple receivers. Okay? It's not one device just to one other. I'm the transmitter. We have 20 or so receivers in this communication medium. So it's point to multi-point or, or simply multi-point medium. Simplex, half duplex or full duplex, this lecture. Half duplex. Sometimes it's Sometimes it's full duplex, sometimes it's simplex. It should be half duplex, this lecture. It means if I'm talking, then no one else should be talking. But if you have a question, then of course you can be sending information back to me. Full duplex would be I'm lecturing and you're talking to your friends. Okay, we try and avoid full duplex. Simplex is just me lecturing and lecturing and you falling asleep. So. Let's try and keep it half duplex for this lecture. So you can ask questions. So what we want to focus on really in this topic is the signals that are sent from transmitter to receiver. What are these signals? How are they designed? How do they carry information? <laughs>
or some electromagnetic signals are sent across our medium and we use these signals to represent data. If you think of the data, if we want to send a file, as a sequence of bits. My computer wants to send bits to some destination, then I need to generate some signal that goes out of the computer that represents those bits. We'll look at different ways to do that. What we're going to see is that the communication signals that people use to transmit across systems, we usually design them to be made up of multiple simple component signals. That is, we take some simple signals and combine them together to get one more complex signal. And we're going to look at the mathematics of that and see how that impacts on our uh, signal design and performance. We'll see that we can analyze signals from two different perspectives, two different domains, the time domain and frequency domain. Time domain you'll be familiar with, frequency domain we'll explain as we go through. Starting with time domain, and let's look at a very basic communication signal. Actually, we've still got a few more, uh, uh, some terms to introduce. And I think you know this thing, difference between analog and digital. You've seen this in, in computing courses and in general uh, uh, physics courses. Okay, we can differentiate between analog and digital waveforms. Analog, the signal is continuous over time, it continuously varying. A digital signal, we think, is that it's some constant level, then instantaneously changes to some other level, like this square wave. So the difference between analog and digital. A uh, simple concept, we can have periodic or aperiodic signals. Periodic is a signal that repeats. Both of these examples are periodic signals. Aperiodic is one that doesn't have repetition over some period of, over some time frame. There's not an example here. With a periodic signal, we can measure its period. And we'll see that uh, through some further examples. So, I want to send information from one computer device to another using some form of signals, whether it's light, electricity, some radio signals over wireless. The person who designs the, the transmitter and receiver designs the signals that are sent and how they carry information. And the very basic way in which they design signals is based upon a sine wave. So think of uh, uh, the simplest signal and usually we come up with a sine wave, something that is varying like this. So you know the shape of a sine wave. So a very simple signal, S, as a function of time, can be expressed as a sine wave. And here we can vary the shape of this sine wave using different parameters. There's a multiplier out the front which is the amplitude. If you can imagine a sine wave, if you multiply by some value out the front, then you increase the height. Okay? So the amplitude of that signal. A sine wave, continuously varying, you know it has some frequency and some period. We can change the frequency from a low frequency to a higher frequency by varying some parameters. So the sine function, sine, as a function of time, t. So depending on time, we'll get a different value as an output. And the general form is 2 times pi times the frequency, where frequency is measured in hertz. So if we want a high frequency signal, we increase the value of f. So think of f as a parameter in this signal. If we want a high frequency signal, increase f, low frequency, decrease f. And you'll see if you plot this, and we'll plot some as we go, increasing f will get a higher frequency of our sine wave. And a third parameter is the phase, phi here. 
It's a bit harder to visualize for most people, but that is a shift of the, that sine wave relative to some origin point. So if we think of some signal that is generated by a transmitter, here's one example where we take over time, we take, say, time equal to zero, the sine, if we set these three parameters, the amplitude or the peak amplitude, the frequency and the phase to constants, then we generate a sine wave that varies in some manner over time. Where we can think is the peak amplitude is the signal strength, say measured in volts, generates some electricity measured in volts coming out of the transmitter. The frequency is the number of times the, the signal repeats per second, the hertz, measured in hertz. And the phase, some relatively, relatively shift of this signal is measured usually in radians. Some other parameters that are related to these three parameters of our very basic sine wave is the period. And you know the period is simply the inverse of the frequency. A frequency of 2 hertz gives a period of half a second. And another parameter is the wavelength. The distance occupied by one cycle of our signal and calculated as the speed of light, C, divided by the frequency. Gives us the wavelength of that signal. So in fact, starting with a very basic communication signal, a sine wave, we can have three parameters that will change the shape of that sine wave. The amplitude, or the, the peak amplitude, the frequency, and the phase. And related to them are the period and the wavelength of that signal. This shows four examples of a sine wave with varying parameters. The first one, so we see on this plot, it, on the time is ranging from 0 seconds up to 1.5 seconds. And as the caption here, we see the amplitude is 1, the frequency is 1, f is 1, and the phase is 0. So if we write that signal, the top left one, say S1 of T, some signal as a function of time. The equation for this, amplitude is 1 times sine 2 times pi times the frequency. In this case, the frequency is 1. I'll write that times 1 times T plus a phase. In this case, the phase is 0. or quite simply, sine 2 pi t. So with this function, as t increases, we get this output. So when t is 0, the s of t is 0. When t is 0.75, the s of t is minus 1, and so on. So we get the, the sinusoid. And it keeps repeating. By changing the amplitude, the frequency, and the phase, we just change the shape of that sinusoid. And the top right one, we see the same equation, except we've changed the amplitude to 0 0.5. The peak amplitude is now half. Frequency is the same, phase is the same, and you see the shape is just shrunk, it, it's condensed. Okay. So the peak goes up to 0.5 and to minus 0.5 here. This, the bottom left plot shows the same as the first, except the frequency is now 2. So it would be 1 times sine 2 pi times 2t plus 0 which is simply sine 4 pi t for the bottom left signal. And we see the difference now is that within one second, we get two repetitions of the, the cycle. That is, we have a frequency of 2 hertz. In one second, two repetitions. 
here we have a frequency of 1 hertz, sorry, from 0 to 1 second. The period of our top left signal is 1 second, that is, 1 cycle, the duration is 1 second. It repeats every 1 second. The period of our bottom left signal is half a second because it repeats every half a second. change the amplitude, change the frequency, last one change the phase. Amplitude is the same as the first one, amplitude of one, frequency of one. The phase here is pi divided by four. The phase is an angle but measured in radians. And what does it do? You can think it shifts that sinusoid along. So take this one and shift it back and instead of starting at zero and going up, it starts at this point and goes up. So it's as if this one has been shifted. By how much? Well, by the phase of pi divided by four. And as you change the phase, you'll see a different shift of that signal. So for now, all we're doing is covering some high school mathematics or physics of the sinusoid, okay, a sine function. And we've got three parameters that we can change to change the shape of that function, the peak amplitude, the frequency and the phase. And this just visualizes those changes, the effect of those changes. So a very simple signal that we want to transmit to carry information, we can generate a signal which is simply a sinusoid, a sine, a sine wave, and think of that comes out and the sine, uh, sine wave representing the, 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 the energy being transmitted is sent across the cable and received by the destination computer. We can easily change the shape of this sine wave by changing these three parameters. In fact, we can change more than one at a time. We can change the amplitude and the frequency. And we can do more complex things, we'll see, is that we can take multiple sine, sine waves and add them together, combine them, to get more complex output signals. And that's the basics of how communication signals are designed. We start with sine waves, allowing us to vary these three parameters and combine them together in different ways to generate the signal that we want to transmit across the system across the communications link. So in the very basics, we can think of all of our communication signals are made up of different sine waves. Any questions? Everyone remembers the sine function ask you to plot in the exam or the next quiz? Well, I wouldn't ask you to plot, but I would ask you to be able to recognize, given this plot, tell me the frequency. So, given this bottom left plot, tell me the frequency. Well, you look and you see it's a sin sinusoid, and it's repeating in one second two times. So every one second, there are two repetitions, so it has a frequency of two hertz. Or, given this plot, write an equation for it, at least in this simple case. Well, you see the peak amplitude is one, the frequency f is two, the phase, because it starts at zero, there's no offset or shift, is zero. So this one would be The signal as a function of time is sine 4 pi f, a uh, 4 pi t. So you need to remember this general function here. That a signal is the peak amplitude times sine 2 pi f t plus the phase. And then if you can determine those three parameters, the value of the peak amplitude, frequency, and phase, then you can determine the equation for that signal. 2 pi times the frequency. If the frequency is 2, we get 4 pi. 
times t. t is the parameter of the function, the time. Let's, let's draw some signals and then do some different combinations of them. Let me just check what pictures we have. Okay, so with our basic sine wave, we can vary those three parameters to change the shape, but we can do more. For example, we can add two different sine waves together. This is an example signal, s of t, sine 200 pi t plus one-third sine 600 pi t. So we've taken one sine wave plus another sine wave and we'll get some different shaped signal as an output. We'll plot that in a moment, or a similar one. So we can combine these sine waves together to get different shaped outputs. And the communication signals that we deal with we can think as being composed of many different component sinusoid signals. They're made up of many different sine waves. And usually at different frequencies. In this top equation, we can say there are two sinusoids. What's the frequency of the first one? 100 watt. 100 hertz, okay, from the first component, let's call this the first component, sine 200 pi t, map it back to our general equation. That's our general equation. Well, let's map it back and see, okay, we have, in fact, we have a multiplier here. 4 divided by pi times sine 200 pi t. What's the peak amplitude of the first component? In fact, this multiplier is multiplied by both components. So the peak amplitude of the first component is 4 over pi. The frequency of the first component well, it's sine 200 pi t. The general form is sine 2 pi f t. So what is f? Well, 2 pi f t, we have 200 pi t, means f must be 100 hertz. Because 2 times pi times 100 gives us our 200 pi times by the time plus a phase, and in this case there is zero phase. The phase is zero in this case. There is no ad additional component here. But we have a second sinusoid. Add it, we're adding two together. So we can give the same parameters for the second one. Peak amplitude of the second component Write it down. Peak amplitude, frequency, and phase of the second component. Try and determine them. Okay. There's this extra multiplier at the front. We'll see the purpose of it soon. But if we multiply 4 divided by pi times by one third sine 600 pi t, then the peak amplitude is simply 4 divided by pi times one third. That's the, the multiplier of the sine function. Sine 600 pi t, what is the frequency of the second component? 300, because our general form is 2 pi ft. We have 600 pi t. F must be 300 hertz. And the phase, again, is zero, because there's no additional component there. Radians, the phase is measured in. 
So in fact, this signal, S of T, is made up of two sinusoids added together. And both of them have different values of these three parameters, the amplitude, the frequency, and the phase. And in general, our communication signals that we transmit, we can think as being made up of as a combination of different sinusoids. It would be more complex than this, but this is the principle that we can add them together to get a different shaped output. I'll show you a plot of this one in a moment. Where each of the sinusoid signals have a frequency, so in this case we have two components with two different frequencies, 100 hertz and 300 hertz, and also different peak amplitudes. Let's plot this before we go on to the next part. Actually, I have it. We'll plot another one later. This is the plot of those. The first two are the plot of the individual components. And the third plot is the addition of the two. Now, the scale on here doesn't exactly match the, uh, the equation. Here, it's a general scale where uppercase T is the, the period. But the shape matches what we have here. We have a frequency of 100 hertz. Well, we have to adjust T here. And then a frequency which is three times as much. 300 hertz. Well, you see the frequency of the second plot is three times as much as the top one. And it's also one third of the peak amplitude. You see, if this is a peak amplitude of one, this will be one third of that. So the shapes at least match our, uh, our components here. When you add them together and plot them, you get this shape. Okay, there's these humps here, two humps uh, at each point here. Importantly in this case, the, the frequency of the resulting signal is the same as the top signal. We see the repetitions here, here, and if we keep going, which is the same as the top signal. And that was the way that the, the equation was set up to produce that. If we take some signal and we make it up by combining different sinusoids together, when all frequency components are integer multiple of one frequency, then that one frequency is called the fundamental frequency, and the others, the other components, are harmonic frequencies. In our example equation, First component was 100 hertz. Second component was 3 times 100 hertz, which matches this condition here. We have two components where this is 1 times 100 hertz. The second component is 3 times 100 hertz. So we say the fundamental frequency, right, F, subscript F, is 100 hertz. And this is a harmonic frequency, 300 hertz. When we add these sinusoids together, which match this condition, then the resulting signal has a period equal to that of the funda fundamental frequency component. The resulting signal has a period and frequency the same as this 100 hertz signal. And that's illustrated on this resulting signal here. We have the first component, the second component, which has three times the frequency as the first component, and the resulting signal, when we add them together, has the same frequency as the first component. So if we structure our signal by adding 
sinusoid together, we can get a resulting signal of a particular shape and having properties, in this case, the properties are that it's the same frequency as the, the fundamental frequency. In general, by combining sine waves with different amplitudes, frequencies and phases, we can design or construct any communication signal we want. So any s real signal that we transmit, we can think of it as made up of individual sinusoids, sine waves. And people use this to design signals. So the people who create your wireless transmitter or design the standard for the wireless uh, LAN or your uh, ADSL modem and so on, they need to create some hardware that generates signals. Well, how do they design that hardware? Well, they design it based upon th these fundamental concepts of we can think of a signal as just a combination of many sine waves. And we can use that concept to design the signal and look at its performance. Let's try and plot some different examples. I'm going to plot them on the computer. Uh, I have some software, just some mathematics software that will produce some plots. Okay, so it's not so important how I do it, the important will be the output uh, plot that we see. So we're looking at some time frame from 0 up to 1, and I'm going to create a sine function and plot it, and we'll see how we can combine them. Uh, let me remember. On a plot, on the x-axis, the time, and on the y-axis, the signal, s of t. And the first one, remember our general our general form of a sinusoid. Amplitude times sine 2 pi ft plus phase. Let's set the peak amplitude to be 1. Okay. 1 times sine 2 times pi times the frequency. And we can choose the frequency. So I've chosen a peak amplitude of 1. a equals 1 sine 2 times pi times a frequency. And let's, just for this example, choose a frequency of 2, 2 hertz, times the time, plus a phase. Let's make the phase to start 0, okay, 0 phase. And let's plot that as a blue line. This is just the software I need to specify. I'm specifying the color. Let's see if it works. Okay. Here's our our signal, peak amplitude of one, so it goes from plus one to minus one. Two times pi times two t, so frequency should be two hertz. Within one second, there are two repetitions, so we see that between zero and one, we get two repetitions, and there's no phase offset in this case. Let's try a couple of variations. Uh, what do we want to do? First, I'm going to change something, set the axes to be... Currently, my axes range from minus 1 to plus 1. I'm going to change that. which means it's the same signal, except I've just changed the plot to go up to minus, from minus 2 to plus 2. We can change the peak amplitude. So a new signal, a red one, and if we change the amplitude to, say, 1.5, simply increases the height. If we have a green one, with the original 1 amplitude and change the frequency to 4, so 4 hertz, we see it's the same height as the blue one except it repeats 4 times in this period of 1 second, okay, the green signal in this case. So changing the amplitude and the frequency uh, are usually obvious to, to visualize. Let's look at the impact of the, the phase. 
Let's start again. So our first signal again. And now let's introduce some phase shift and see how that impacts. Uh, so before I had plus zero, let's add pi, uh, pi over four. Okay, so this is measured in radians. So we can map it back, back to degrees if we want, but the input is radians. And let's change the color. We see the difference between the, the red one now has a phase of pi over 4. We see visually it's shifted. Okay, by introducing this phase, we have this shift of the, the, from some point of origin. And we can keep changing the phase. Pi over 2. Another one, 3 pi over 4. Yellow, it's hard to see. And simply pi. Can you see the last one? Yep. So by changing the phase, we see this shift of this signal in the, uh, in the time domain from some point of origin. So that's the change of the three parameters. Now let's consider if we combine two together. Take our original signal. And then add a new one, which is a third of the amplitude. And instead of a frequency of 2 hertz, change it to 6 hertz. So I've shrunk the peak amplitude by a third and increased the frequency by 3 for the red one. And now if we add the two together, what do we get? Take the first one, 2 times pi times 2t plus the second component. So now we have a, we're going to plot a signal with two components. And we see the green one. Same frequency as the blue, the original component, but we have this different shaped signal. We'll add some more components shortly and see how that impacts and what that results in. First, all right, we're sending signals now. So we can use sine functions and combine them to generate a signal of a particular shape. But let's say we want to send bits from computer A to B, what, what can I do to send zeros and ones? How can I shape my signal? Any ideas? OK, so, but considering these basics, these basic sinusoids, what can we use? How can we use them to uh, represent zeros and ones? assign an amplitude to bit 0. So if I want to send a 0, I send a signal at one amplitude. And if I want to send a bit 1, I send a signal at a different amplitude. So that I'll send these signals, and when the receiver receives a signal, it will measure. If the amplitude is low, for example, that means that someone just transmitted a bit 0. If the amplitude is high, it means they transmitted a bit 1. Okay, so that's the basic, a, a basic way that we can use these signals to represent data. 
let's say I want to send the sequence a sequence of data with four bits. The data I want to send, 0, 1, 1, 1. Okay, it's four bits. Of course, if we focus on these four bits, we want to get them from A to B. So what we do is we generate a signal that represents this data. And let's use the scheme that says if we want to send a bit 0, we send a sinusoid with a low amp amplitude. If we want to send a bit 1, we send high amplitude. In fact, we can simplify that and try and draw a case that captured that information. Uh, let's try. And what we do is for some period of time we send a signal to represent the first bit and then for another period of time, the same period, we send a signal to represent the second bit and so on. Let's see if we can use just a sine wave to do that. So for this case, we need to send four different bits. So I'm going to do that over a period of one second, our time frame. So we'll break that into four different uh, chunks of time. I've set this up before, so it's a bit simpler. Uh, I'll explain it as we go. So for the first, if we imagine this one second is broken into four chunks, each a quarter of a second long. So for the time set 1, T1, we're going to plot our sine wave. And in this case, the frequency is 2, the peak amplitude is still 1. Let's change the phase to be pi. You'll see why in a moment. And let's set the axes so to be correct and for the second time time slot I'll use the same phase and the third time slot I'll use a phase of 0 and the fourth time slot a phase of pi So what I've done is, over time, I've changed the phase of this sinusoid, this sine function. So I've used the same peak amplitude over four time slots, 1, 1, 1, 1, the same frequency, 2 hertz, 2, 2, 2, but I've simply changed the phase in this example. And this is the resulting signal that's, say, transmitted across our link where we're using the scheme when it's low, it represents bit 0, and when it's high, bit 1. So 0, 1, 1, 1. And by changing the phase, I get the shape of the signal that uh, represents the data I want to send. Whenever I want to send a bit 0, I set the phase so that we go down. And bit 1, the phase so that it shows a, a, a positive peak, negative and positive. A very simplistic way to transmit bits as some signal. It may not be like that in real life, but it captures the, the basics. How fast did I send bits? Uh, well, no. Think of bits now. Think of how do we measure the speed of bits. Last week, uh, in, in fact on Monday, data rate was one measure of how many bits we send per second. How many bits per second do we send in this very simple example? Four bits were sent. Bit one, two, three, four in a time period of one second. Four bits per second. What was the frequency of our signal in all cases. 
Remember, if we look at the sign, the peak amplitude, the frequency, in this case, is 2 hertz. In all cases, it's 2 hertz. So I set that. So using this simple scheme, a negative value to represent bit 0, a positive value to represent bit 1, we transmit this signal. The receiver should receive a signal with similar shape. And what it does, for the first quarter of a second, it measures the amplitude. OK, it's close to minus 1. Therefore, it must mean a bit 0 was transmitted. Then it measures the amplitude, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. It must mean 3 bit 1s were transmitted. In this simple case, using a sinusoid with one component with a frequency of 2 hertz, we had a data rate of 4 bits per second. Let's try using a different signal and see what happens when we change the signals that we use, how that impacts upon our data rate and our other performance metrics. How am I going to do it? Uh, let's draw it again. Instead of having one sinusoid component, I'm now going to generate a signal using two components. And it has some structure which you'll soon notice. I hope it works. Now we have a signal which has two components sine 2 pi 2 time 1 plus pi. Peak amplitude is 1. Frequency of this component is 2, phase offset is pi, and a second component with one third amplitude, frequency of 6, and a phase offset of pi. And we're missing a, a bracket there. Let's see how it goes. And then we'll do that for the other time periods. Same concept, but now we're just using a different signal where, again, negative amplitude represents a bit 0, positive amplitude represents a bit 1. So 0, 1, 1, 1. The only difference is now I've used a different signal to generate the resulting signal. Here I use two sine components. And you see the way that I've structured it is that the second component is one-third of the amplitude of the first and three times the frequency. Here it was two hertz, here is six hertz. I can keep adding components. So this has two components. If I add a third component using a similar structure, we can get a similar shape signal but slightly different. We'll add one more. Actually, we'll see in general what I've done come back to that what we're doing is similar to this this is a 
a signal with two sign components. You can see in the caption sine 2 pi ft generally one third sine 2 pi 3 ft. We see the shape with these two humps at the top. In this case it's positive, negative, positive, negative. This is if we add a third sign component. And the pattern we see is now plus one fifth sine 2 pi ft. Five times the frequency as the first, one fifth of the amplitude. This is with four components. The last one is one seventh of the amplitude and seven times the frequency. This is with an infinite number of components using this same pattern. And we see we get a perfect square waveform. Now, we can use this same approach to send our zeros and ones. Instead of just sending a sinusoid, we can send, in theory, perfect square waveform where we'd say, for example, plus one represents bit one, minus one represents bit, bit zero. And we'd get a plot. I'm not going to do it on the computer, but we'd get a plot like this. for our 0, 1, 1. Over a period of one second represents bit 0, it's a negative value, bit 1, 1 and 1. Again, we'd use the same signal, except we can change the phase to de determine the output shape. The one I draw on, drew on the board represents the same data as this one. Different shape signals, different signal transmitted, but are carrying the same four bits, 0, 1, 1, 1. and at the same data rate. Four bits in one second. And in this one over there we got also four bits in one second. So we can choose and design signals differently to carry our data. We'll look and compare which one is better. Is this square one better than the one on the screen to send data? Well, we'll see that generally it is in terms of quality because the receiver in the pe presence of errors, if there are errors in this one, it's more likely that the receiver will be able to still determine the correct bits. If there are errors in this one, there's more of a chance that they'll get the wrong bit. And we've got a detailed example of that uh, later. Let's step back and see what else is different amongst the different signals. So we skipped over a few slides here. What we've been doing is taking sinusoids and changing the shape and now combining them, combining them together, adding them together in this case to get a different resulting shape. We can look at the, some of the parameters or performance metrics of these signals. And the way that we can make this easier, this is the signal in the time domain. Let's look at it in the frequency domain. And there are mathematics, Fourier transforms, that can convert a signal in the time domain to a frequency domain. We're not going to cover that, we'll just look at the end results. Here is a plot of the same, so looking at the bottom signal here, made up of two components, Note the difference between the two components. One has a, oh, the second one is a third of the peak amplitude, it's a third of the size, but three times the frequency. And we add them together and we get this resulting signal. In the frequency domain, what we do is we consider the individual components and we consider their peak amplitudes and their frequencies. 
This is a plot of the same signal, the bottom one on the previous slide, but in the frequency domain. How we interpret this is say that at 1f we have one component with a particular peak amplitude and at frequency three times that we have a second component with a third of the peak amplitude. So this is the same signal but looking from the frequency perspective, not as a function of time. And the reason we do this is because it makes analysis and design much easier for the, for the engineers that must make the devices. Let's try and do that with a, a real example. And then we'll define some terminology to finish. Let's take a signal and we'll, I'll create a signal and then we'll draw it. space. Here's a signal with three components. 15 times sine 2 pi 4t, so 2 times pi times 4 times the time, plus 5 sine 2 pi 12t, plus 3 sine 2 pi 20t. So I've created this signal. Let's analyze the individual components from our general sinusoid equation. So we have three components. What's the amplitude of the first component? 15. Easy. Just the multiplier. Frequency of the first component. Keep helping me. 4. Okay, remember the general structure, 2 pi ft. What's the frequency in this case? I've written it easily. I could have written 8 pi t. That frequency is 4, 4 hertz. Phase, in all cases, there's no plus anything, so the phase is 0. I won't, I won't write the phase. Second component, amplitude is 5. Frequency is 12. Third component, amplitude is 3. Frequency is... 20 hertz. Plot this signal in the time domain. Well, I won't ask you to do that because you need a computer to get it accurate. So if I ask you to plot this signal in the time domain, I could do it on the computer, but uh, It's not exactly the same, but it would look something like this. Okay? This would be the shape. Now, for you to plot that in the time domain is, again, you need a computer to get the exact shape there. But let's analyze this from the frequency domain. And, and we can first plot it in the frequency domain. In the frequency domain, the plot shows the, the, the peak amplitude as a function of the frequency for each of the components. Here we have three components. We know their peak amplitudes, we know their frequencies, so at a particular frequency we plot an impulse, a spike. I won't try and plot it in the time domain, but in the frequency domain, 
Here's frequency in hertz. And here is the peak amplitude of the signal as a function of f. This is an uppercase s. It's a notation. So at, what have we got? At 4 hertz, we have a component. May not be the greatest scale. At uh, 12 hertz and at 20 hertz. We have three components. We know their frequencies. We know their peak amplitudes, 15, 5, and 3. So we'd plot an impulse, 15, 5, and 3. That is the plot of the signal, the equation, but given in the frequency domain. The reason for using the frequency domain is to make the analysis and, and uh, the design of the signals easier. It's much easier to do operations in the frequency domain than the time domain. And many signals are analyzed from this perspective. Now to finish, let's introduce some concepts that we can gain from this. We can say this signal, S of T, has three components. The frequencies of those components are 4, 12, and 20 hertz. For any signal, the spectrum of that signal is the range of frequencies it contains. So for our signal, we can say the spectrum is 4, 12, and 20 hertz. This signal contains three components with these three frequencies. That's the spectrum of that one signal. Another term. The absolute bandwidth of this signal is the width of the spectrum. Our spectrum ranges from 4 hertz up to 20 hertz. Therefore, the absolute bandwidth is 16 hertz. from 4 to 20, that's the width. So the bandwidth in this case, 20 minus 4, 16 hertz. Some signals may have a, a DC component. We'll not cover that yet. So there's two new terms that we've introduced, spectrum and absolute bandwidth. Spectrum of a signal, the set of frequencies, the bandwidth is the, the maximum frequency component minus the minimum. In fact, on this plot, it's very easy to see the bandwidth and the spectrum. It shows us the spectrum, and the bandwidth, the absolute bandwidth, is just the maximum minus the minimum, 16 hertz in this case. We will see, and we'll show some examples that so indicate that the bandwidth of a signal and of a communication system impacts upon the data rate the number of bits per second we can send. And in, generally, in general, the larger the bandwidth with other things fixed, the higher the data rate we can achieve. So if we have another signal which, with a larger bandwidth, we can increase our data rate. But there are some costs of increasing the bandwidth. Let's see if we can summarize with one more or finish with one more example. Same example. Let's say I now have a, another signal with just two components. I remove the last one. What is its absolute bandwidth? So a second signal, two components, what is the absolute bandwidth of this second signal? It's 8 hertz, because now we have two components, amplitude 15, frequency of the first component 4 hertz, second component, amplitude of 5, frequency of 12 hertz, so the spectrum is 4 hertz and 12 hertz, the bandwidth is just 8 hertz in this case. 
So we'd say this signal occupies a bandwidth of 8 hertz. If we transmit this signal through our system, it uses 8 hertz bandwidth. The first signal used a bandwidth of 16 hertz. In general, the larger the bandwidth, the higher the data rate, the faster we can send bits. So the, the signal with a higher bandwidth is better from that perspective. But another trade-off is that the higher the bandwidth we consume, the higher the cost involved of transmitting that signal. So we'd like a signal with a low bandwidth, it's cheaper, but we'd like a signal with a high bandwidth because we can send more bits per second. So there's a trade-off there in that when someone designs a signal, what signal do I transmit across my Wi-Fi, my wireless LAN, then they need to consider that trade-off of do we design one with a large bandwidth or do we limit it? Uh, so the trade-off between data rate and cost. Next week we'll go through that uh, trade-off and look at some other factors as well with a, with a detailed example. What we want to summarise for today. So we haven't gone through all of these factors. Let's go back. All of our communication signals can be made up of, we can think of it as sine waves. Where a fundamental sine wave is the peak amplitude times sine 2 pi times the frequency times time plus a phase. Varying those three parameters change the shape of that sine wave. Combining sine waves together, we can get signals of different shapes. As we see in this case, adding these two, we get this different shape signal. And in fact, if we add an, in, in the pattern that we saw, if we add an infinite number of components using this pattern, we eventually get a square wave, a perfect square wave. We can use this signal to represent bits. For example, transmit a high level to represent a bit 1, a low level for a bit 0. So from that, depending upon the, our, our frequency, we can get some bit rate, number of bits per second. One bit, another bit, and so on, and determine a data rate. These signals are in the time domain. Most analysis of communication signals performed is performed in the frequency domain. And just going back, in the frequency domain, domain as a plot, we look at the individual components, determine their peak amplitude and their frequency, and plot an impulse or a spike at that particular frequency and with that peak amplitude. So this is a plot of the signal in the frequency domain. We can also write an equation for that, or do some analysis mathematically. And the two terms so far we've defined are spectrum and absolute bandwidth. Spectrum is simply the range of frequencies in that signal. Absolute bandwidth is the width of the spectrum. What we'll do next week is show an example that connects all them together. In particular, bandwidth, data rate, and other factors like cost uh, and errors.